We're ready. <laughs> Hi, Steve. Anytime, Paul. One moment, sir. <clears throat> Okay, you're live. Hey, everybody on Facebook and the PRN and all the other Egberto's uh, radio station, all the other folks that are carrying this. This is your first national emergency election protection webinar. We want you to know how to protect the 2020 election come the fall. And we have less than five months to do it, as you all saw in Georgia and Wisconsin. And you didn't see, but it did happen anyway in Ohio. We have chaos at the polls, and chaos is not good for democracy. So uh, I am Harvey Sluggo Wasserman. We have been conducting weekly meetings on, the, on Zoom. We've had 10 of them on how to protect the election in 2020. This webinar is basically a symposium, a forum, uh, to give us a clear, usable document so that if you are interested, uh, if you're more than interested, if you're committed, to protecting the 2020 election in the fall. We are gonna give you the basic information on how to do that and who to contact. We have an incredibly great lineup here. Uh, 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 Emily Levy from, Lee Levy from uh, 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 Scrutineers, Susan Pinchon from Florida, Andrea Miller, who is the, the leading expert on uh, election uh, uh, voter registration. Steve Rosenfeld, who's been doing a tremendous amount of coverage on this as a journalist, Egberto Willis, uh, Joel Siegel, and Mimi Kennedy from Hollywood, California, around the, uh, around the uh, corner from me. The basics are this, and this is what we want. We want the basics. We have a trifecta, or for those of you who are religious, a trinity of election protection. It boils down to this. Number one, voter registration. What are we gonna do about registering people to vote? There are as many as 16 million people who have been stripped from the voter rolls. It is a critical part of how the election uh, is going to take place. There are millions of people in the United States, perhaps you included, who uh, think you're registered and are not because you've been stripped mostly by um, right-wing uh, legislatures, especially in the heartland states of Wisconsin, Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Florida, Arizona, all these states have extreme gerrymandered right-wing legislatures, and among their bag of tricks is to strip people from the voter rolls. Everybody who wants to vote, intends to vote in November or in the fall, because you, it's more than just one day now, uh, you need to check your voter rolls. And if you don't know how to do it, I'll, Andrea will uh, be, you'll tell us how to do it and, and offer her contacts. This is a critical part of the election, obviously, is how many people are registered, how many think they're registered, how many are not, and how to get re-registered. And Mimi knows that there are deadlines on this, so we're going to come back to this in a minute. Second, vote by mail. Because of the COVID-19 uh, uh, crisis, the pandemic, um, we don't really want people going to the polls if you can vote by mail. Uh, this is a first. We have had five states in this country, and I'll come to this in greater detail that have been vote, doing vote by mail a long time. All states in one form or another have been, had absentee ballots for the duration. But in most cases, we're expecting to go from 5% to somewhere between 40 and 80. And this presents tremendous problems. It's a great opportunity because we will have uh, paper ballots, but <laughs> there are a lot of serious logistical challenges to having, you know, jump up from 5% for a state to 40 to 80 percent vote by mail and we'll be talking about that finally vote counting how are the votes going to be counted if they if millions of ballots are coming in by mail and millions more people are showing up at um, um, polling places what is the mechanism to count these and it's not simple we do have ballot imaging devices in most of the country virtually all of it but and they are they they uh, make sense on paper the question is, will they work in real time? Are they hackable? And, and, and all of that. At the end, we will have, we're going to actually, I'm going to uh, sprinkle through the uh, presentation here, people that you can contact uh, for documentation. We have posted at at least three places, as much documentation as we can possibly provide. 
My articles are at Reader Supported News and elsewhere where you can look them all up, or you can email me. My email is solartopia at gmail. If you wanna get in touch for further information and you don't know where else to go, just email me straight, Harvey Wasserman at solartopia at gmail, okay? So these are the basic three items we're gonna cover. This is the, the, the heart and soul of this upcoming election. Uh, the registration rolls, vote by mail, and counting the ballots. And uh, uh, taking care of this business is gonna be, it will determine the future of the United States in more ways than we can even begin to describe here. So let's start in, I wanna start with Emily Levy. She has a group uh, called uh, um, Scrutineers. And she is both doing, uh, well, Emily, let, let's talk about it. Tell us what you're doing at Scrutineers and how to get a hold of you. And you can put the uh, contact in the chat room. Thank you, Harvey, for including me on your call. I'm Emily Levy, as, as you said, and I'm the founder and director of a brand new election protection organization, an online membership community called scrutineers.org. And we exist to help people like you who are watching, learn what you need to know about elections and train you in the election protection activities that will make the most difference in having the elections be just, fair, inclusive, accurate, secure, accessible, all those transparent, all those things that we want to do. So we are about um, motivating the country to take action on all of these issues and supporting the work of other election protections or organizations around the country. So both individuals and um, and organizations can join scrutineers and there are different benefits for each in joining. You can find us at scrutineers.org. Um, come join us, find out what we're already doing learn how you can get involved. And one thing I want to make sure everybody knows is that there are a lot of things that you can do to protect the elections from home. A lot of times people think, oh, I can't get involved in this because right now I really need to stay home to stay safe. And we want people to stay safe. Uh, we also want people to be protesting in every way they can think of right now about the atrocities that are going on in this country. And when it comes to protecting elections, a lot of the activity that needs to be done can be done from your home. So come to Scrutineers and, and learn about what that is and get connected. We have a national project we're going to be launching very soon. We'd love to have you be part of it. And I want to just shout out to those of you who are already part of other election protection groups. Um, we want you to come tell us what you need help with. We've got a lot of volunteers who are saying, what can we do? And we're helping them understand the issues and the ways they can get involved. And they want to connect with groups in their area or groups who are working on the projects that they want to get involved in. So if you are part of an organization and you need help, um, you can, excuse me, come join us and we'll talk about how we can support hey, your work. Wonderful. Scrutineers, S will you spell that please? Yeah, S C R U T I N E E R S dot org. And I will okay. put it into the chat both in Zoom and Facebook. Please. So you can find documents there. You can uh, talk about training and, and much else at, at scrutineers.org. Thank you very much. And of course, you know, we are completely um, uh, nonpartisan here, in, not only in terms of, of uh, parties, but also in terms of organizations. We welcome all organizations that are fighting to protect the election in, in the fall. And uh, we, we don't want any infighting, any of that stuff. There's no, this is not a, uh, 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 any kind of ideological uh, or, or sectarian situation here. We have gone through 10, count them, 10 Zoom calls with no infighting and no ideological ban or none of that stuff. We are about the, the trifecta of protecting this election. Okay, so number one, and thank you very much, Emily, much appreciated. Uh, number one is voter registration. This is a huge issue and, and because uh, the voter rolls are, are, are susceptible to being stripped. And I will say one thing, Avalia Jones brought this up in an earlier call. Um, uh, we have millions of people marching, thankfully, uh, uh, for, to end uh, police racism and, and brutality. And the, every one of those millions of people, and if you are one, please, they, everybody needs to be registered to vote. For God's sakes, and not only register to vote, but help us protect this election. It's not enough in this coming election just to vote. We need everybody active and, and, and dealing with this, 
trifecta. So Mimi Kennedy, you had a couple of issues and then we'll go to Andrea Miller that you wanna raise about uh, uh, their de deadlines and other things that everybody needs to know about voter registration. So can you chime in with us, please? Yeah, the main thing that um, I've been trying to do is organize a voter's calendar so that once it's published and it will be on several websites by the end of the week, we'll all know what we ourselves can do for ourselves and for one another. And the voter's calendar starts in August. On August 5th, Steve Rosenfeld researched and told me, that after August 5th, it is illegal, federally illegal to purge anyone from the voter rolls. You can newly register, you can join the registration rolls, you can file new registration, you can register other people yourself. You cannot purge any names without committing a federal crime. Therefore, starting August 5th, the voter's calendar starts. It's voting season and you need to check your registration if it's correct, take a screenshot, Google, how do I take a screenshot with my cell phone? That's what I did. You take a screenshot file and date it. There's your registration. If it's not correct, update the name and address. Uh, voting, then you need to know that you have to apply for your mail ballot early. They don't issue them until later, but you can do the application early. You have to check with your state and locality. I always give that caveat as to whether they will automatically issue you an application or a mail ballot or whether you have to opt in with an application. Uh, if you're an inactive voter, note that it'll be on your registration. You wanna turn yourself active, that'll be a phone call. Once you're an active voter, sometimes just applying for the application for the mail ballot will make you active, but this should all happen by the time September is midway through. It's uh, application month, September. October is when you receive your mail ballot if you've applied. The mails are going to be slow. We know it, COVID, the attacks on the post office. So we voters have to help the post office and ourselves by applying for everything early. So that's uh, September. And then by October, you should get it if you don't got to call your registrar. We're going to publish how you can get that information all the way to and your we're, county. We're, people now, I've been texted by um, Alan Minsky, uh, the great Alan Minsky, who's the executive director of PDA, Progressive Democrats of America. Uh, people need to go to pda.org and and, uh, and check um, uh, for more information. We will providing more, be providing more information. Write to me directly. Uh, uh, and Andrea Miller, uh, thank you so much, Mimi. Yeah. Um, and, and everybody. And I just want to uh, add early yes. voting. Early voting is really important to use, especially if there's any problem with your mail ballot not having arrived. Yes. The earlier you get a ballot, the better it is, and the and send it back, or you can even walk it back in in some cases, which gets complicated. But th those details um, uh, are, are essential. Um, someone has asked, where will the calendar be? And what can people do now? Um, uh, the calendar will be published by the end of the week on Progressive Democrats uh, of America.org, and we hope it will be published in Common Dreams. It'll certainly be on our website, and I would like to circulate it to anybody on this call. If you'll send your email address to Harvey, and once we know it's going to be published by one of these places by the end of the week, we can just send it to you in email. Beautiful. And it has all Beautiful. the information I'm talking about and more. Yes, uh, again, don't be shy, contact us, contact Progressive Democrats of America and contact Andrea Miller, who's, who's now gonna tell us about her amazing organization and the work that she's been doing on voter registration. And remember, you know, it's uh, the one thing we look at is if, if you've got the virus and you decide to go 100% vote by mail and you get rid of all the precincts and then you don't mail out the ballots or you challenge everybody's registration, that's where this election could go down the drain. Very, very serious. So Andrea Miller, you have been in the trenches now already uh, getting people registered and re-registered. Tell us about your organization. Tell us about what you're doing and how people can plug in with you. All right, well, thanks, Harvey. We work with deregistered voters, meaning these are people who used to be registered, but they are no longer registered. Um, I always like to use Texas as an example because Texas, like California, is basically a country. 
when I look at Texas in January, they had 13 million voters, but 5.1 million of those voters had been deregistered. Deregistered is a term that I use, meaning the people were originally registered active voters and now they're not. So when you look at your voter registration status and what Mimi said is really critical, you must check your voter registration status. I'm going to say at least three times a year because your status can be changed by your board of elections county registrar, literally at a moment's notice. It may be the day you looked, you were active, you were registered. It may be the next time you look, what do you mean I'm inactive? The only way to stay on top of it is to check, not once, but at least three times a year. When we look at Texas, there were 5.1 million deregistered voters. One of the things that we do is we run phone banks. We will call voters who are on that list. But unfortunately, a lot of those voters registered a long time ago. So that means we have old phone numbers. Now, I know everybody's going to find this very, very interesting. People always talk about, oh, we have to go register our young voters. Our young voters are registered, um, or at least they have been getting registered. And normally they get registered right in high school. We get those registrations. Voters don't start getting deregistered in large numbers until they hit their 40s. Why are voters deregistered? Uh, they may have a felony conviction, but the big one that takes so many voters off our rolls is simply not voting. Voting is not a right in the United States. Voting is a privilege. And if you don't do it, you will lose the privilege or your ability to vote. Now, when voters get removed from the rolls for not voting and it's not consistent from state to state. Some states say you miss three federal elections and then don't vote in the fourth, meaning you're over for three. They're going to move you over to an active. You miss another federal election and now you're deregistered. Other states are more aggressive. They may say two federal elections, you don't vote. We're looking at moving you to an active third election you miss, now you're deregistered. It varies wildly from state to state. If you check your registration status, then you'll know if your status goes from registration active to registration inactive. Now, can inactive voters vote? The answer is yes, but how easy they're going to make it for you to vote is going to vary wildly from state to state. Some states, simply the action of applying for a vote by mail ballot or just calling your county registrar and saying, put me on the active list again, will make you register, will make you active. In other states, if you show up to vote and you are inactive, you may be asked to vote provisional. You may be asked to provide additional ID. There are any number of variations that states may come up with for inactive voters. The critical thing to know if you end up on the inactive list is the inactive voter list is the pre-purge list. If you are on that list, that is the temporary list. Either you go back to being active or you are going to be relegated to unregistered. And unregistered voters cannot vote with one really, really cool, notable exception among our, I call them our voter suppression states. So normally we're talking about the South. 
there is a great feature that we love in North Carolina, and that is during early voting, if you have been deregistered or even if you have never been registered before, you can register and vote same day. That is not true in most Southern states. Now I'm not talking about California. California's got its own rules. California is a very progressive environment. I'm talking about states that are not progressive in their voting policies. Uh, some people may call them red states. I normally just say states that are more aligned with suppressing the vote than they are with helping voters actually exercise their ability to vote. So checking your registration is key. What we do is we send handwritten postcards to voters who are on the deregistered or unregistered list. And we tell them, you may no longer be registered to vote in your state. Check your voter registration status. And we always give them the official state website to go and check. And then if the voters are older, if they don't use computers, we also give them the phone number of their county registrar. Again, I cannot emphasize enough, check your voter registration status because if you are unregistered, in most states, especially those that do not offer same day registration, you will not be able to cast a regular ballot. If they are a good state and they're willing to give you a provisional ballot because you are unregistered, that will be a valid, they will not be counting. Okay, so Andrea, uh, fantastic. How do people get a hold of you and, and you know, uh, uh, folks, uh, our view of this election is that it will be decided, at least for the presidency, in six or seven uh, uh, swing states, which is Wisconsin, Michigan, uh, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Florida, and Arizona. Now, all six of those states have very red, very aggressive uh, anti-democratic -de uh, legislatures. Uh, four of them have Democratic governors, Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and North Carolina. We, we're trying to see what kind of difference this will make. And for those of you who don't think you can make a difference, I'll point out very importantly that North Carolina, against all odds, just passed a very progressive um, uh, pro-democracy piece of legislation. That's really, and this is North Carolina, where there's been just flat out warfare. So Andrea, tell us, tell everybody listening, please, and post it on the chat, how do people get a hold of you? And what is the name of your organization? The name of the organization where we do our election work is, is the Center for Common Ground. And Harvey, I'm going to add some more states to your list. Texas okay. had 5.1 million deregistered voters. They now have 3.4 million. So we are getting a nice little crack in the number of deregistered voters. And we are 39 electoral votes short. So it's going to be very, very interesting. We are working in Texas and Georgia and Alabama again, and even Mississippi. So we have an affinity for the Southern states. Our organization is Center for Common Ground, and I'll put that in the chat. And I'll also give you my email address. We have between eight, maybe 10,000 volunteers, and we've sent 1.7 million postcards to deregistered voters so far this year. That's very impressive. And you gotta remember folks, there are less than five months until this election. And Andrea, your numbers are spectacular. People, if you wanna uh, uh, volunteer or put out the word to other people to volunteer, please contact Andrea. I'm sure you'll take people from other states and, and, and send them where, where they need to go there. Our organization, our goal, our organizational goal with these calls, both this one nationally and our, our Monday Zoom call, is to build in every state 
and in every county, a network where people are totally aware of every aspect of this election. This is going to be a very logistically, you know, forget about the polls, forget about who's ahead this week and who's not ahead. You know, what matters is how the voting is done. That the, the, the three pieces of how the voting is done, that's what's key. And that's what's going to decide everything. So uh, we want people, and it's all, it's, this is not a national election. This is state by state, county by county. Every state has its own rules. Every county has their own rules. And whatever county you're living in, you need to go down to the election board and tell them or, or become part of it and at least understand every aspect of the situation. Uh, Alan Minsky and Steve Rosenfeld, you've co-authored this um, uh, uh, calendar with Mimi Kennedy. Uh, Steve, you've texted that there's an article up at Common Dreams. Is that right? Yeah, well, yeah let, Alan, let Alan talk about it. Alan, uh, you're on here. Uh, Alan Minsky, go ahead. Yeah, hi. Well, this is an article. Again, it was, uh, it, I have to um, try to super mute this. I apologize. I'm on two calls Steve, at once. OK, yes. Um, the the Common Dreams article is up. It is called The Voters Calendar 2020. And um, I just want everybody on the call to not just share it, but if you can share it off the link at the bottom of the article, that's important because Common Dreams sort of, that's how they judge how articles do. So if you can share it to everybody you can on Facebook. And I think that's important because as we work with our allies and support everybody, it's important to boost all of each other's projects and that will, because I really trust Andrea Miller to follow through and achieve what we're trying to achieve here. I trust Harvey Wasserman to follow through and achieve what we're trying to achieve here. I got to tell you, I don't have that much trust in a lot of better funded organizations that are claiming to embrace this cause right now and push it through. We are the real grassroots people that really truly believe in democracy. Every person gets a vote. And we're going to push this as hard and as well as we can. And everything, every one of our projects that we can boost up will be to uh, all of our collective advantage, those of us who are okay. really, truly, honestly pushing for democracy. So go to commondreams.org, share the article for the Facebook link at the bottom. And what it is, is this thing, just letting people know, step one, this is the calendar. You've got to do this by this point. And then, as Andrea said, do it again, do it again. And then in September, you have to do this. After you had to do something in August, in October, you have to do this. And this will assure individuals that they will be able to track and guarantee that their vote will be counted in this unique election and in this environment where we know people are going to try to disappear our votes. So right. it's a Very good. piece and people go to it. The link is in the chat and it's up on Common Dreams. It's called Voters Calendar 2020. Thank right. you. And thank you, Steve and Mimi. Thank you, Alan, presidentdemocratsofamerica.org. Uh, thank you, Steve. Um, uh, my articles about uh, the overviews of this are generally published at readersupportednews.org. You can go there and support them as well. They've published five, six of my pieces about this. And, um, and uh, so rsn.org or email me and I'll send you an email with uh, my five or six of the, the latest pieces on this. Uh, anything else real quick on voter registration? Okay, uh, and, and remember, <laughs> Just to give you a little idea, in Texas, where Andrea Miller is working, uh, and in most cases, you want to try and avoid a provisional ballot. Provisional ballots have, uh, it's not 100%, but provisional ballots have a way of finding their way into the trash bin. You want to get a regular ballot and vote on a regular ballot. And just to give you perspective on what we're up against, in Texas, uh, you can register to vote. They have ID laws there. You can register to vote with a hunting license or a gun license but not a student ID. So <laughs> there you go. That kind of says a, a lot of it for, for our, our situation in American democracy. Okay, we're going to move ahead now to vote by mail. But first, Egberto, you have a, a radio station, a radio uh, a show. We want right. you to talk about that real quick and how we can continue to get the vote out. Uh, real quick, I, I just wanted to mention, first of all, it's great hearing from Andrea and what's going on here in Texas. That's where I'm at. And that 1.3 million was excellent. Now, as far as what I wanted to come out is we are great out here in, in the things that we put out, all the data that we have. But the most important thing is that we have to reach people. Uh, we don't reach people quite often within our own space here with our radio stations, meaning uh, uh, what I do, what you do, Harvey, at with Pacifica Network. 
Uh, we are tools that we that want to be used. Uh, we want to be used in every particular avenue possible, social media, email blasts, et cetera. So if, if you have data or anything, uh, jo uh, earlier on, uh, Alan Minsky was talking about us collaborating with all the works that we do among each other. I think that is one of the most uh, salient statements that we need to uh, come up on. You guys have things that you want to get out here, contact, uh, throw it my way. I'm sure okay, it's got a Give us your price. context, Egberto, give us your context. You're our electronic media it's, guy and um you know you're a lot younger than i am so <laughs> it's e willies i'm not a lot younger e w i l l i e s at gmail.com e willies at gmail.com anything that you want to get out there i'm on several networks that, and i'm trying to put things out there and this is a project that i that that when harvey invited me to be a part of it uh, i wanted to be uh to be active and productive in excellent absolutely essential and thank you so much and We'll discuss our ages off camera. So, um, <laughs> so uh, we're next piece of the puzzle. Next piece of the the trifecta is vote by mail. Now, I'm going to talk about vote by mail, and Mimi will join me. Um, we, uh, I got involved in this issue when the election of 2004 was stolen up close and personal in Columbus, Ohio, where I was living. And what killed us was electronic voting machines. Because, and Steve Roosevelt came in and we worked with Bob Fetrakis, who's gonna be on in a few minutes. And uh, we showed how they used uh, electronic voting machines in the state of Ohio to flip the vote count. So now all these years, 16 years later, only 16 years later, we're finally looking at, because of the pandemic, of a massive switch to paper ballots. Now, uh, to me, this is a great thing. It's not great that they're gonna to strip down the number of precincts and all that stuff. And the big danger is you go to vote by mail and then they don't bail you the ballots or they do crazy things. Like in Southwest Ohio, I couldn't make this up in 2004, the election, the entire national election was decided in three counties in Southwestern Ohio. And they sent out absentee ballots <laughs> that did not have John Kerry's name on them. <laughs> so what says, that says is that you're, in your county, where you are, you're all nice and happy that we're going to vote by mail and paper ballots. Somebody has to go in there and look at the ballot before it's sent out. What we are advocating now, four and a half months from November 3rd, is that everybody go in and integrate yourselves now into the, uh, the election boards, into the county, county by county process. This is not a national election. This is a state by state election and all the states need people in the counties. What you gotta do for vote by mail, you gotta proofread what they're gonna print before it goes to the printer. You gotta make sure the printer's actually gonna get the job done, which happened in Georgia, they didn't get the job done. They didn't get the votes printed, you know, ballots printed, a uh, uh, big surprise. You gotta make sure that there's enough ballots printed so that not only does every absentee or, or vote by mail person get them, but that they have paper ballots at the polling stations, whatever polling stations are left, they have to have paper ballots. We hear time and again, people show up and they literally run out of ballots, which is what they did in Ohio 2004 on purpose. So as you being part of the local county election board, make sure they print enough of them. Then we gotta get them out we got to get them to people. And in many cases now, you're required uh, to uh, file out a form. They don't just mail ballots to registered voters in many states. They mail you an, a an application. Now, there's no reason why we can't have applications everywhere. When Sherrod Brown, the current senator from Ohio, was secretary of state of Ohio, he had, uh, absent he had uh, applications for ballots everywhere, including McDonald's and the voter and at the, 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 the DMVs and, and wherever you looked, Sherrod Brown makes sure there are applications for ballots. We have to make sure that they don't shape, shortchange people on applications for ballots. There's, got, there's no reason not to have them anywhere. You know, everywhere, you, can have, you don't want ballots lying around everywhere, you want applications if required. The ideal is that every registered voter should be sent a ballot without the applications, but you know, that's a barrier they're putting up and we're gonna have to deal with it. Okay, then we got to make sure that the ballots are delivered to the, and that's going to be an issue with the Postal Service. As we know, Trump is trying to kill the Postal Service, and this is why. There are other reasons, but 
Now, this is why the Postal Service is under attack. We got to make sure when the ballots come back in that they can be warehoused. It, it's a, not a small issue. Ballots come back in, where will they be stored? What is the chain of custody? Are they going to be secure? And we don't want them counted early. Many of the precincts will have the urge to count ballots as they come in. No, 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 we don't want that happening. We want them protected, we want them safeguarded, but we don't want them counted until uh, uh, evening of November 3rd. And, 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 and that's, uh, Mimi, do you wanna add something in on, on paper ballots to and vote by mail on this? I will, you've just discussed something that's procedural. In uh, most counties, they are trying to get the what they call processing of the mail ballots out of the way before the onslaught of at polls ballots and provisional ballots in other envelopes whose signatures need to be checked arrives uh, on election night. Therefore, they do what they call processing the mail ballots as they come in. I have tried. Harvey to get them to not do that. Just wait everything. In fact, I want them to look at the provisionals before they process the mail ballots. I have received a state level and, and absolutely not, but they say they're processing. They are not counting. They are not counting. Nobody can get a tabulation of what the votes actually say. They just process the outer envelopes to make sure that they're legitimate ballots that can be counted with legitimate signatures. There is a problem there, but I don't want to get into that now. However, I wanted you to know that when people go and see mail ballots being looked at on October 25th, they go, oh my God, they're counting them, but they are supposed to not be counting them. Citizen observation can enforce this to some degree, but they are processing them and then they will slap through the scanner on uh, election okay. night and add those results to the at polls results. Just I wanted to make that distinction because right. it's an example of what we learn as citizens observers and it's an important distinction, but it's one that needs to be enforced. And oh, Mimi, this is Susan. I just like to let you know that in Florida, they start counting the vote by mails 21 days before the election and they are counting They're, and they count the early, they can count the early voting as, as it goes along. And there's no federal uh, rules no federal law, against no. that. So once again, thank you, Susan. It's an yes. example of you don't trust anybody, including me, always check what goes on locally and act <laughs> accordingly to protect your election. Well, as Ronald Reagan said, trust, but verify. I never thought I'd quote Ronald Reagan on a <laughs> vote by mail uh, discussion, but, but the, the important thing also is, and this is, a, there are a lot of hidden things here that can kill us. And one of them is deadlines. Now they had two major court cases in Wisconsin about deadlines. When, when, do they need, when do they need to go out? When do they need to come back? Uh, when is there, there has to be a postmark by election day. And you know, one of the things that happened in Wisconsin, and this is how really deadly serious the details are. The courts ruled uh, certain things about, the, and there had to be a postmark on the ballot by election day for the ballot to count. Well, guess what? Thousands of ballots came in, in Wisconsin with no postmark. The, the, the post office just didn't count them. So how was it decided? It was decided arbitrarily by county supervisors where, where, which votes would be counted and which wouldn't, with the, the ones without postmarks. And I was told in, in some instances, there were as many as 30,000 ballots that came in without postmarks. So the reality is in a state like Wisconsin or Michigan, if it comes down very close in the electoral college, the entire presidency, could be decided by the arbitrary decision of a single county supervisor as to whether or not they're going to count ballots without uh, 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 postmarks. I mean, that's how arcane this gets. And that's why people need to be totally on top of the details in your county. Mimi. I want to add, because people start thinking, well, then I won't mail it. I will certainly drop it off. And in our article, we've researched uh, that it's different where you can drop it off and where you can't. You can drop off a voted mail ballot in its signed envelope at some early voting centers in some states. 
other localities, only at the county clerk registrar's desk. But I am asking people, if you get a mail ballot, take it with you in its envelope because there might be a way to make sure you can get it in early, not using the mails, not worrying about delays, but people don't understand how valuable that ballot is once you get it. And many, many times when I'm a poll worker, I have had people say, I left it on my desk because I'm voting here and now. And there were complications. If you get a mail ballot, apply early, vote it early, or keep it with you because if you think you can drop it off on election day, very often in some places you can't for the reason we're discussing. Election offices don't want to be dealing with a bunch of signed envelopes vote by mail when they're dealing with counting all the ballots to come in on election night and then looking at provisionals. They don't want to see those mail ballots, so some say can't drop it off. On the other hand, I was told this was so in Wisconsin, cannot drop it off on election day. I went to this Wisconsin website and there's a new rule. March 31st, oh yeah, yeah, you can drop off a voted mail ballot in its envelope on election day in Wisconsin, so says the website now. Again, things could change. We always need to check, but early is always a cure. People Thanks. need to be on these election boards. You need to be inside and starting now because the details change and the detail and, and deadlines are a huge issue. Susan in Florida, we know that last election, the, um, the US Senate seat went to uh, Rick Scott, who had been the governor, by 10,000 votes in an election where the deadline for counting the ballots was impossible to meet and, and, and in terms of the recounts. And they just threw out God knows how many ballots and said, Rick Scott, you're now the senator, U.S. Senator. <laughs> so, you know, this, this is extremely important. Deadlines uh, for receiving ballots and for counting ballots and for reporting uh, are all over the map, all over the United States. Whatever state you're in, whatever county, and you need to know the detail. I do want to say one thing. Uh, my email just showed me uh, that LeBron James is actually starting a huge voter rights uh, organization. Now, he won't talk to me because I'm from Boston and I'm a Celtics fan. But if, if those of you who are Laker fans uh, can get to LeBron, we really, we really need his help. It's a fantastic thing, we, but we need to know what he's doing and, and help him uh, 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 connect with us. Okay? Vote by mail, any other questions? Steve Roosevelt, do you wanna jump in on vote by mail real quick? Any detail? Well, I would just say this. I, I, I've been covering these elections state by state um, it, before the pandemic and since the pandemic. And what I've seen with vote by mail is um, there is a paperwork, a river of paperwork that m many jurisdictions are not equipped to handle. And it comes in successive waves. Some places, for reasons that are partially political and, and just legacy, force people to apply. Those applications have to come in. Then they have to get processed. You know, in Georgia last, last week, I, I heard of you know, one Atlanta County being 100,000 applications behind. When that, then once they're processed, that county, by the way, shut down for three weeks because they had COVID cases in, inside and they didn't have phone numbers posted to forward. But once they're processed, they went to a contractor out of state that then mailed the ballots. And then the ballots had to come, you know, become in. And they all, again, like you go to a polling place, you have to verify the envelope, the signature. So you get, before it can be, even be open to counted. So what I'm saying is, what we're seeing is, beyond all the finger pointing is these election offices are understaffed, under-equipped, under-resourced, resource to handle this volume. And what that means for voters is you have to be on the front end of this process. And the reason, you know, that Mimi was talking about, you know, let's start this 90 day deadline, for, you know, that falls on August 5th beyond the point where things can no longer be purged. That's legally, they may purge in some states and then that would go to end up in court is because the elections that are being take, taking place right now, there are 25 statewide elections or runoffs between now and the Florida primary in late August. The rules that are being set for those may not hold for the fall. So it's great to become familiar with the voting by mail environment and, and voting at home environment, but the rules may not be the same. And we, and, need, to, and, we need to really know what's going on. Well, it's those, what's happening is state legislatures are about to meet 
and will and are about to debate. And in some cases, we are seeing things go backwards. Right. So, so that is your Yes. North so, Carolina did okay. We know in Ohio is a catastrophe. Well, the, the Ohio legislature has been overruling the Republican Secretary of State. Look, and the, it worse. The, 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 the only, here, here's here's the thing. This process has is relying on new technology that 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 is too complicated for the task at hand. There are too many places where things can break down. There can be choke points. There can be failures by just in it inadvertent you know no conspiracy stuff then there's the way then there's the legacy of like jim crow laws and other rules that make it even harder to get stuff done on time all of this is happening in different ways in different states to different degrees so the the, the bottom line here is not only you have to be early in this process and proactive if we don't want to have these crazy recount fights in november we have to have big enough margins. And what that means is, you know, I am told that only 80% at best of the mail-in ballots that are sent out get returned, 20%. Right. So, so, so what this is, it just, Harvey, it just keeps raising the bar and raising the bar, but this is where what we're facing and this is why we're having calls like this and what we're talking about. And it's just about getting these basic steps nailed down. Right. Get your information. So, it's a, it's a moving target. Uh, the legislature is jumping in. We did well in North Carolina against all odds. We're getting killed in Ohio by the legislature, which is overruling the Republican Secretary of State and make things worse and worse. Now, Susan Pinchon, thank you, Steve. Okay. Susan Pinchon, you're in Florida. Let's talk about counting the ballots, uh, the machinery that's going to be involved. You know, Stalin uh, of, uh, famously said it doesn't matter who casts the ballots, it matters who counts them. So tell us uh, about electronic digital imaging and what we're looking at in terms of counting the ballots nationwide. Hi, Harvey. Uh, yes, uh, counting the ballots is of course a public process, voting is secret. And one thing that I'm very involved with, um, with John Brakey of auditelectionsusa.org, um, are ballot images and Many of them of the people on this call probably know that most of the voting equipment across the country now uses digital scanners to scan the paper ballots. And those digital scanners take a picture of the ballot and that picture is what's actually counted. The votes are actually being counted on the picture. And, uh, and that picture is called a ballot image. And I apologize about the video. I see I'm being asked to turn yeah, it on. Yeah, I can't sorry. do that, sorry. So you'll have to take that okay. note off there. My apologies. <laughs> okay, so, but anyway, so, but the ballot images, um, these pictures of the ballots, again, that's what's actually being counted. And all around the country in many jurisdictions, they are deleting those ballot images. They're erasing them. And that is a critical part of counting the vote. We want to be able to look at those ballot images after the election and verify the vote count. And as John Brakey always says, we wanna make sure that our elections are real, but it really does go a long way towards voter confidence and candidate confidence to be able to see the ballot images. Now in Dane County, Wisconsin, they actually post the ballot images on their website. And if you go to Dane County elections, and that's Dane like Great Dane, D-A-N-E, Dane County, Wisconsin, there's a tab at the top called audit. And when you scroll down on the audit tab, you see do it yourself audit. And you can scroll down and they have posted all the ballot images for all their elections. And you can go to whichever election and you can see your race if you're a candidate, you can see your precinct if you're a voter or the whole county if you're a voter. So that's this a great, is we, this is something we want. This is a good thing. So I understand from you and John Brakey that these digital ballot Im readers imaging, basically the, the paper ballot comes in, we hope vote by mail. They run it through the imaging machine. They create a, a digital ballot image. And then the paper ballot is preserved on the, uh, in a bin on the other side of the machine. So that we count, you can get a very quick vote count beating all deadlines, hopefully, uh, with the ballot imaging, and then uh, if there's a, uh, a, a contest, a recount needed, you still have the paper ballot. Is that a correct uh, 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 description, Susan? 
Yes, that's a good description, Harvey. And, it's, so, it's, and, so, and, and these machines are prevalent. They're, they're all over the country. The question, I, uh, John, I knew, I think, of estimated about 80% uh, the precincts have these digital imaging machines, except of course in Georgia where they bought machines that don't work uh, for $110 million. But um, Susan, how available are these machines in the precincts around the country? Yes, they're, they're, John's right. That's it's about 80% all the, what we used to call optical scan machines are all pretty much now digital scanners. And those digital scanners create a ballot image. And those images can be counted and um, and used to check the election. So we're fighting, you know, John's uh, organization, Audit USA, and again, his website is auditelectionsusa.org. He's working with Scrutineers, which is Emily. I don't know if she's still on. Yes, yeah, she is. But um, uh, because Emily okay. is coming up with the volunteers to help count the ballot images. So if you want to get involved, folks, if you're concerned about this election, go into your election board, find out what machine they got, make sure they're going to turn on the, the, the imaging uh, uh, capability. We've had situations all over the country, especially in Ohio, where they have these ballot imaging readers, they have the ballots, they run them through, but they turn off the digital scanning to create the electronic uh, uh, image of the ballot. Well, well, the image is automatically created. That's a big oh, thing. Oh, yes, they throw it away. I'm sorry. They, yes, they delete it because it by, by, by federal law, they have to save the ballot images, but they're not saving them. So John's organization has been bringing lawsuits around the country to enforce the law. And we, yes, if you, if you are uh, someone who's interested in this, first of all, get hold of scrutineers.org to volunteer, but also Yes, go in and see your own election administrator. As Harvey said, get involved in your election office now, but go see them, ask them. That's in my county three years ago, I asked her to save the ballot images and she committed to doing it. So, and they need to turn that feature on in when they set up the election to save or not save those ballot images. So ask them to please save them. Yes, and then that, that will give you a, a very rapid uh, turnaround on election results. You can then do a recount, but you've got to know what the uh, deadline is for the recount. As we said, U.S. Senate seat in Florida was decided when they shut off the recount, uh, just like they did in Florida 2000, uh, that put George W. Bush in the White House. So these are details that you can only know by going into your local election board. And the time to do it is now. I mean, there are deadlines. This is the calendar. Is at commondreams.org um, uh, from PDA. That's uh, absolutely uh, essential. What we need is people, if you're concerned about the outcome of the election, you need to go in now to your county board and be, they will welcome you for most cases because they don't have enough people, for God's sakes. Right. Call them up and, and I, wear your mask. And uh, Mimi, real quick, because we're almost out of time. Someone's oh. asking on the chat about emergency paper ballots at the polls and that there aren't enough and that that's yeah. a problem. I want to say why there won't be enough and why stressing the importance of ordering a mail ballot this year is so important and doing it early. You might need it. The reason there aren't a lot of emergency um, ballots at the polls is that many states have gone to vote centers, both for early voting and sometimes even on election day, to produce the correct precinct ballot on demand so you can vote for everything that is pertaining to your district, including state house, which we know how important that is to not have that taken over by just one party. You can't you can't keep all those emergency ballots on hand just in case you get so-and-so from these precincts and then from that. that. That's again a paperwork problem for an underfunded county that's, you know, trying to do, you know, the, the schools and the social services and save kids and, you know. Right. So then Harvey, so Harvey, can I, well, Susan, could I, could I say, right. could I say one quick, could I, Harvey, this is Susan. I wanted to add quickly to something Andrea Miller said that I think is really important, if which okay, will take got, 30, 30 seconds. Yep, which is in some places in this country, they, they are, have altered the voter registration rules and thrown people off who are legitimate voters. In Shelby County, Tennessee, almost 6,000 people were told they'd already voted when they had not. So even though provisional ballots are not always counted, every voter needs to know they have a right 
to a provisional ballot, whether they yep. are a voter, an a, inactive, a, a, off the rolls, ask for, if you, they won't give you a regular one, ask for the provisional and it might get counted, but don't let them send you from the precinct without at least a provisional ballot. So what we're gonna do is we're almost at the hour mark and we have a P PRN and some other people need an hour package here. So I wanna wrap this part of it and we'll continue. We have covered the three basics, which is voter registration, vote by mail, and, um, and counting the ballots. There's a ton more to, we're gonna stay on for another half hour, but I wanna say to all my listeners at Progressive Radio Network, thank you for joining uh, the Green Power and Wellness Show. This has been a special edition uh, on voting. And um, if you need to get find out more, contact me, solartopia at gmail. If you wanna donate, go to freepress.org. That's freepress.org, Bob Fetrakis' website. Uh, hit the donor button and then put in a note um, uh, that you want this uh, dedicated to our voter protection, uh, election protection uh, uh, campaign. Uh, we, are, we have three agendas. We want to do some PR. We'll need money for that. We want to put out a, a voter handbook, which we'll do collectively. And then we want to hire state by state organizers. I mean, we're dependent on volunteers. Any money we can get, we'll go to putting, we'll go towards state by state organizers, primarily in the swing states. But uh, as Andrea said, Swing state is a, a state of mind. Uh, 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 so again, thank you everybody for this one hour segment. We're gonna continue for another half hour with additional questions. If you have questions, email me, Harvey Wasserman, uh, Sluggo, I'll get it as well. Solartopia at gmail.com. Joel Siegel has been part of this uh, setting up the framework. Uh, Joel, real quick, um, uh, look, tell us what the state of our network is and how people can help, help build it. Oh, uh, you got to unmute. Hey, buddy, you got to unmute. Uh, okay, you're muted. Anyway, I, 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 we're oh, going to continue. Can you, can you hear there me? We go. We're gonna, yes, we're going to continue for a half hour, another half hour. Those of you on one hour programs, thank you very much for joining us. This has been the uh, election protection, emergency election protection, COVID-19 group. Please join us, email me, um, and, and uh, we can protect this election. God help us if we don't. Okay, you, Joel Siegel, let's proceed. How is we yeah, coming with our network? Uh, tell me my time limitations, because I know you got people- Give us a couple about. minutes. Well, I mean, I think everyone really explained pretty well that we're, I'd like to hear the word emergency. Um, we, are, we are in an emergency, and um, I am helping to organize with Harvey and many of the people on this town hall uh, an emergency election protection campaign with elected officials and election protection leaders to ensure safe, fair, and transparent elections. My, my experience is I worked in Congress for uh, 13 years with Congressman Conyers. I've been the Democratic Party for over 40. I was the progressive, you know, within the party. Um, what we're doing in North Carolina is we are forming a coalition of, of conscience that's mainly led by African-American leaders and we're getting state legislators who are progressive, mainly of color. We're getting um, precinct captains, and we're we're gonna we're gonna go to our to the Secretary of State and the State Board of Elections, and we're gonna we have enough power to do that now. We are going to demand a voter protection plan that deals with absentee ballots, voting machines, all the tranches that we've talked about. Um, you know, um, uh, vote by mail, w whether or not there will be, you know, voter suppression, because they purged several hundred thousands of voters in North Carolina. Andrew Miller's got the date on that. If we don't form these kind of coalitions in our swing states and the battleground states, then I talked to a very senior level Democratic official, and she said, Joel, I'm worried about a what if scenario. What if Trump wins? because we progressives did not come together at the right time with enough power to make sure we had safe, fair, transparent elections. What if Mitch McConnell remains the Senate majority leader? Only because there's two conversations going on. One is in the nonprofit world with several voter rights elect, uh, groups. Then there's the partisan groups. What we're gonna try to do in North Carolina is bridge that divide and, and cross pollinate and form one coalition and 
We want to know what are, what are their plans to have a safe election. That's what did not happen in Georgia. In Georgia, which was a, a, a fiasco, uh, and Maryland, which was a fiasco, there wasn't enough pressure placed on, as Tom Hayden used to say, those levers of power to ensure fair elections. I think this format is terrific in terms of the knowledge that we're getting. I think Andrew Miller really is doing great work in terms of, of building very strong coalitions on the ground in Virginia and other states. And that's what we're replicating here. We're also doing intensive voter registration in the black community as well. COVID-19 makes us all very difficult. So it's, it's coming along fantastic. And having paid organizers really helps too. Okay, so we don't have them yet, but hopefully we'll get them. But um, uh, you, Joel, are, are building coalitions uh, in the African-American community. Um, this, this, this election demographically will be decided by uh, millennials and people of color and um, um, now uh, uh, elderly. The elders now, uh, there seems to be movement on that. The, uh, the hardest nut to crack appears to be the evangelicals. We don't know what's going on, but uh, the bottom line is that uh, our, our, our goal here is to protect the physical contact, conduct of this election. And, you know, I'm getting, we're all getting uh, solicitations for groups that claim to be doing that work. We need to know who is doing what. It's, uh, you know, it is not that complicated. This is not rocket science. The move to vote by mail changes everything. Harvey? Going to paper ballots changes everything. But as I say, you can't go to paper ballots and eliminate the precincts and then not send out paper ballots. That, and, and, and don't laugh, everybody has, we have confronted that time and again. I mean, Bob talk about Ohio in a minute, but Joel, you wanted to say something yeah, more? Yeah, I, you know what? Um, the Republican party is gonna spend $50 million, it's in the New York Times, to suppress the election and cause what Harvey Wasserman calls chaos at the polls. They're gonna have 50,000 people go to the polls. Many of them will be malicious with Confederate flags and guns. I know it's hard to believe, isn't it? They're gonna spend a lot of money on, on lawsuits, uh, saying that there's voter fraud. All this is like literally stormtroopers in, in, in the Nazi Germany trying to stop Hitler from being elected. I'm, I'm not using exaggeration, I really mean this. The question becomes how much is the, are the Democratic Party spending to secure the election? It's minimal. Uh, they're not doing that much on voter suppression, but LeBron James is stepping up, Michael Jordan is stepping up. So one of our strategies is to get to Tom Steyer, to get to LeBron James and Michael Jordan. And believe it or not, we actually have contacts with those folks to see if we can fund some of the organizations on the ground, um, <clears throat> like Andrew Miller's or the one that I'm working with in North Carolina. Okay, so let's talk about funding. We, we're not funding raising on this uh, call, uh, but we uh, do want to know that people do want to give money. Uh, a friend of mine just told me her husband, uh, my buddy, uh, sent money to Kentucky. But we, we want to know who and what they're doing. Bob Fatrakis, can you? And also, I want to emphasize we are posting all documents. Anything having to do with protecting this election, uh, links are being posted at Scrutineers with Emily. Um, at freepress.org, Bob's website, um, and, and um, also through Paul is, has set up uh, the ability to post uh, uh, documents. So if you have documents you want posted, or if you want to scrutinize what's going on, uh, go to freepress.org, go, go to Scrutineers. Paul, where can they come with you? And, and, and if you'll unmute Bob, we can hear from Bob on- I want to, I want to say something real quick, Harvey. Please, Egberto. Yeah, I want to piggyback off of something very important that Joel said. Joel made the point that 50,000 Republicans are going to be out there, militia, et cetera, with flags and all of that. The best thing that you have in this country is disinfectant, light. Uh, we, have to, uh, we have to expose in every direction, in every avenue, in every aspect of social media, touch by touch. The, the, the Republicans are going to be out there, not with masks, because they think they're invincible from COVID, while many of us are going to be hiding. What we have to do is, yes, many of us will be hiding, but those of us that aren't, we have to build our own, uh, our own thing that 
prepare people for knowing what heart, what, what uh, Joel was talking about. Let them be that when they get to the polls, they're not scared of the, the, that flag. They're not scared of seeing those guys with the big guns. Let them be pre-prepared for going into that battle. And for that, we have to get the message out wider than from our sort of insulated circle. Yeah, and you know, we've seen these incredible marches. I mean, I saw aerial photography of the march in LA on Sunday. It, was, it had to be 100,000 people. Now, if we can have 100,000 people protecting the polls, or it really is gonna take millions to protect the polls on November 3rd and before, that will make the difference. Every we make person it a war. Part, yes. We make, we make it a war. Those same people that are activated now, if we get the right kind of modal to them, we can activate them to be, you have to go be the protectors. Absolutely. And, you know, this is nonpartisan. I mean, we, we um, uh, rightfully uh, accuse the Democrats or have shown the Democrats did some pretty questionable things in the, in the primaries uh, to keep Bernie Sanders uh, uh, where he was kept. And uh, now it's the Republicans in the general election. What well, we're talking about free and fair elections here. And you know, if people are gonna be showing up at the polls such as they are in November, then we are gonna need with guns and with flags, we're gonna need nonviolent protectors there, election protectors to uh, make sure, and they can bring folding chairs and drinks and stuff like that. That'd be a good idea. But we're hoping that the lines in the fall are not gonna be so terribly long. I wanna get Bob Fatrakis on. Bob, can you? Speak real quick. Can you unmute? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, this is Bob Fatrakis in uh, Columbus, Ohio. I want you to talk real quick about going to the freepress.org, about posting the documents there and about donating, and then give us a very quick update on Ohio, because I've mentioned it a couple times. Yeah, there's a, if you go to uh, freepress.org, there's a donate button. Uh, we should try and make sure that uh, people put in comments and let them know that it's for this uh, 2020 election protection. Uh, Cause I think we have about three or four uh, election projects where uh, fiscal managers for. So uh, suggest uh, election protection, but try to get them to put in uh, 2020 or at least put in Harvey or something that. Uh, Logo. But you, you, you are a 501c3. So people who donate to the free press, We'll Ryan, get a tax write-off. Uh, I just yeah. ran about 30 of them to the bank today. Yeah, Columbus Institute for Contemporary Journalism. It's been a 501c3 nonprofit since 1986. So there you go. Okay, now uh, give us a quick, We I've mentioned a couple of times, you have these uh, gerrymandered uh, GOP legislatures that are uh, just tearing the election process apart. We somehow got a bill through North Carolina is pretty good. But my understanding is real quick, Bob, that the Ohio legislature has been overruling the Republican Secretary of State and making things worse. Can you describe exactly what the situation is in Ohio? Well, the uh, House Bill 680 uh, was passed just the other day. Uh, and again, the uh, postmark, it now has to be postmarked uh, if you send in uh, a voting or a mailed ballot uh, a week ahead of the election. It used to be a day before the election. Uh, the Democrats wanted postmarked by the election. The Republicans won by uh, saying it needed to be postmarked a week before the election. And again, it was running uh, 10 to uh, 14 days uh, for a single mailing. Uh, also, the, it looks like uh, that there will be a ballot application form uh, where it will be sent to all voters. The Secretary of State, Frank LaRose, has actually decided uh, to spend federal money he was getting in uh, so everyone will get a ballot application, not a ballot. The Dems had proposed, of course, everyone got a uh, ballot and every uh, person eligible in the state would be registered uh, by election officials. So those things lost as well. Uh, also, there'll only be one early voting site. Uh, 1.2 million people in Franklin County 
will have the same as uh, Vinton County, which has 10,000 people. So this should cause a massively large line of cars uh, and voters on election day. Uh, and again, uh, recall last time I told you that if you're, you're only allowed to vote on election day if it goes wrong and you don't get a ballot in the mail or you can't postmark it in time is that uh, you're now in a situation where uh, you've only got one place uh, where uh, you can go. Uh, and unless you're homeless uh, and again, or disabled and can certify it and vouch for it, uh, they won't accept our count your provisional. Uh, yeah, so let's make this incredible. This is just incredible. We're talking about Ohio here, right? Yeah. If you are registered to vote and you fill out your application and you send it in and you don't get your, your vote by mail ballot a week before the election to mail in or before the election to block it in, you cannot, unless you're homeless or disabled, you will not be able to vote. Let me run that by you again. If you do not get your vote by mail in your ballot in time and you go in and you don't, you've, you've registered to vote, you have applied for your ballot, it has not come to you, you go into the poll on voting on election day, if you are not disabled or homeless, you will not get a ballot. This is Ohio. The ballot, it just won't be counted. It's just, it's insane. And, and, and you know, I can't, I, I'm almost speechless. I mean, and I, if you don't, if you apply for one and don't get it, uh, the Republicans have now ended your ability to go to your board of election or the secretary of state and actually apply for one if one hasn't come in. Uh, in fact, here's a little card during the primary. Secretary of State LaRose, uh, if you didn't get it, you could actually go online and request it yourself. The Republicans have now stopped that feature. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, if you want to see the poster child, this is why we're not counting Ohio as a primary swing state, because it is so beyond, uh, uh, I mean, it's going to be very, very, Bob has got him forming a network there and all that stuff, but to win any kind of fair voting procedures in Ohio, it, it is it is just absolutely beyond the pale. Does the uh, people at large ask, know Mimi, that? Mimi had, a, Mimi had a hand in that Egberto. Hey, Bob. Uh, I, I want to ask a clarifying question to, to, so I can see this picture. I've applied for my vote by mail ballot. I have not gotten it. There's early voting seven days, even the weekend before election day. I want to go tell them I didn't get my mail ballot. I want to make sure I can vote. So I want to cancel the mail ballot they thought they sent me, but I never got. And I would like to early vote here. Obviously, it seems to me early voting must be on an absentee ballot. That's what early voting is. And they yeah, say that I, that's how they essentially define early voting uh, in Ohio. So they're telling us that they have no power to cancel a mail ballot on the say-so of the voter saying, I didn't use it, I don't want to use it, I want to vote here and now. Even at an early voting site, they do not allow that kind of cancellation on the voter's affidavit say-so and give them another absentee ballot to vote then and there. Because you're supposed to track absentee ballots. They're supposed to know they sent you number 1,511 and you're now canceling that and now you're voting on number 2,700. Uh, uh, they're it's not, better. obviously not, right? Bob, Bob, no, uh, no actually the, you can go in uh, and get it canceled. What they've been doing is reducing all the hours you can do that and only allowing one site in the entire county uh, which in Franklin County really is, uh, you know, not convenient to transportation in a bus line. 
Okay, so it's not a legal rule, but it's a, oh my gosh, we can't. What Steve's been saying, they're overwhelmed and they're gonna use that as an excuse and we're screwed. So we need to get around that. Hey, Thanks, Bob. Uh, Egberto, Egberto and then Steve. Yeah, this is a question for those who know Ohio. Is that, a, is that known around Ohio? Is that something that just pe more people need to know in Ohio or is it uh, sort of underhanded? Well, no, no one knew about this. Uh, you couldn't vote uh, uh, in person unless you were, uh, but it had been part of the law. They had just passed it uh, after they called off the in-person voting. So uh, people were actually uh, stunned and some election officials uh, weren't even aware of it. Okay. Are there, are there um, what is the early voting situation in Ohio? Uh, well, uh, again, uh, they got rid of, uh, the whole uh, golden week where you could kind of go down and register. So it will go on. The, the main thing they're doing is restricting. There's only one site uh, uh, where that can happen. And they've reduced the hours, uh, particularly on the Sunday before election day, the souls to the polls day. So, uh, and again, so it, used to be, it used to be open all weekend, used to be open eight hours. Uh, uh, Bob, how can people uh, contact you, especially in Ohio, to work to reverse uh, Well, uh, again, uh, robertfitrakis at gmail.com or uh, write us at the free press. Freepress.org. Okay. All right. Uh, some, Charlie uh, Cray has uh, uh, emailed and said he's uh, put in 100 bucks. Thank you, Charlie. You're great. And Greenpeace is great. Charlie's still with Greenpeace after all these years. Fantastic. And Greenpeace, by the way, has a, uh, a voter protection wing now. A campaign at Greenpeace, and we're really grateful for that. So there are a lot of organizations working on this. Steve Rosenfeld. Yeah. So this is so this is a question to Bob. And um, so in the primary, we knew that there was something like forty thousand provisional ballots that were issued, and then I think something like something like ten thousand or a little bit less. You know the exact numbers are, are, are were um, were were counted and the rest were rejected. Or some number of them were accepted. So how can there be no provisional ballots in the general? Or is this different legislation, no rule? Because I would this, think- This is a brand new led state legislation. Uh, LaRose has made it clear that under federal law, whether they'll be counted or uh, not, you have a right uh, to cast a provisional ballot, uh, you know, based on, uh, you swearing something went wrong. So the question becomes, you know, uh, will they uh, be, uh, be counted? And the Ohio law says, unless you're disabled again or homeless, they're not really counting provisional ballots. Oh, okay, so that's Ohio law, but provisional ballots are where federal law part yeah. of how, so with that, does well, that they're, they're, gonna, they're gonna what? accept these provisional ballots. The question is whether they're gonna count them. And they'd find a legal way to say no. They can't just say Ohio law says we don't have to count this. Well, they're under a legal rubric that they have to try, but that is when they will find out a way to go. We're past certification date, cannot do it. The signatures don't match. We can't cure it. They will find a legal way. That's the danger. Well, well if you didn't apply for a ballot a week before the election, uh, you're automatically not going to be counting. Oh, yeah, the no, I'm the mail ballot. In Agreed. other words, that's the clash between I don't have to count your provisional. It's not my fault you didn't get your mail. You didn't apply. Look, your application says November 1st. So your and, provisional. And there's also no way now to apply. Either you get it from the Secretary of State who missed 1,039,000 people uh, in 2016, uh, but you can no longer apply to the county or the state on its own. What, what, <laughs> what was that? This is you applied for a mail ballot, you mean? Able, like if you didn't get your application from the Secretary of State, you used to be able to go online. They sent out this little card in the primary telling you how to get a ballot. Uh, they've done away with that in House Bill 680. Uh, you can no longer, if you don't get your application uh, for a ballot, you can no longer apply to the Board of Election or the Secretary of State with the new legislation. 
uh, it's unbelievable. Ohio like you. is, is uh, you know, an utter, and I will point out that there was a, an anti-gerrymandering bill that was proposed in 2006 or thereabouts to set up a an anti-gerrymandering commission that would have had a transparent bipartisan uh, commission to set the districts in Ohio for the con congressional and uh, legislature elections. And, the de and so the Democrats intervened and killed it because they thought they were gonna redistrict the state themselves in 2010. And then they got bushwhacked or uh, and they had a shellacking as Obama said in 2010 and the Republicans swept the state and completely gerrymandered the state. And everything we're facing now in Ohio in 2010 is because the legislature is gerrymandered and the Democrats let it happen. So the same time that California got this great redistricting uh, commission set up in the mid 2000s, 2006 and eight, I think, there was one election for uh, the house and one, for, I mean, one for the state assembly and then one for the congressional districts. And the guy who made it happen, who put, and, and so California has the best districting situation in the country. It has a transparent bipartisan slash nonpartisan commission. And the person who made it happen was Arnold Schwarzenegger, who put $3 million of his personal money into passing that. Now I mentioned that because after this election, if we still have, God willing, some kind of democracy, our next project needs to be to get these redistricting commissions in every state. And, uh, you know, a weaker one just passed in Ohio, but we need the California model to go to after, after the 2020 election. We have six more minutes to go to uh, 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 1.30 California time. Um, uh, I, I want to ask Paul, Paul Zeitz, you, thank you for engineering this call. And you have set up a website of some sort. Can you tell us about that and what's available at that website? Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, at Build a Movement, band2020.world, there's a, co a voting rights uh, webpage that has all the recordings of all the prior calls. And this uh, webinar will also be posted there as soon as possible. We've also been publishing some key articles there as well. And we're using our Facebook and social media platform as well. I'll, I'll yeah, put the link in the chat. What's the link? What's the uh, URL? Uh, and 2020.world. Okay, so put that up on, on the uh, on the thing. Uh, if uh, uh, Mark Carlin is on, uh, uh, in the general, I want to thank Mark Carlin for his wonderful website, buzzflash.com. And um, um, does anyone else have something real quick that they want to sneak in here? Okay, I want to, everybody to understand, we have been doing Monday calls. Uh, we won't, this will be the Monday call next week. And, and the time saw it at Facebook, this will be up. This has been recorded. If you have an outlet, or if you want to get the link to this and send it to all your lists, that would be great. Post it at your web, at your Facebook, at your website, uh, to your email lists. Paul will have the uh, the the link um, soon, and we'll send it to all of us, and we'll use that to push this around. The first hour of this was designed to make to be a comprehensive document to get to look at the three basic elements. Uh, of protecting our election, the uh, the registration, the vote by mail, and the counting of the ballots. Egberto brought up how many people we're going to need uh, at the polls, such as they are in the fall. And you know, I look at these rallies that are going on. These are unprecedented rallies, and these rallies and marches are not just about racism. They're about whether we want a police force in this country that's at the beck and call. Uh, of, a, of a dictator in Washington. We are really talking about whether or not our police forces are gonna be a Gestapo, and I use the term advisedly, or are they gonna be accountable police forces? This goes way beyond race. I mean, race has been the, 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 the lever, but you know, the, the, the protection of our civil rights and civil liberties and our basic habeas corpus freedoms are really at stake here. So I hope there's a way to convert all this amazing energy that has come out since the George Floyd killing into election protection. 
And obviously, the, most of the marchers are young. And, uh, and we really need to do this. I, I don't think I have to make it uh, the obvious any clearer. OK, does anyone want a final word? Are we good? Joel Siegel, I saw you jump up. Yeah, I, I'd like to have a final word. Go for it, brother. Um, I think what we need to do is establish um, a very high level emergency election protection task force, uh, which would be, I would say, a few members of Congress, state legislators, mayors, uh, progressive organizations that come together, do some kind of a press conference and say, if we do not change our election system, we are moving into uh, the new Jim Crow and authoritarianism. And when I was in Congress and Paul Zeitz worked on this and Mike Hirsch, you know, I used to establish task forces in the Congress and they were very effective uh, in getting things changed and taking issues that were below the radar. If anyone wants to work with me on that task force, because I, I, am, I am setting it up as, as we speak with those same people I just mentioned, my email is joel.r.siegel at gmail.com. If we don't do something really, really big and do it fast, um, I fear the worst. Where I'm quite optimistic is people like you, Harvey, and Mimi, and Steve Rosenfeld. You've been doing this. I started working with you in Congress in 204. But thank right, you Bob for Petrangis. leading. And I, I said at the, at the um, meeting that you organized, I sat next to Bernie Sanders. Right. And uh, I, I don't know where he's been on this, but these people have got to be activated. This is the Paul Revere ride here. And uh, we're down to it less than five months. Joel, go ahead and finish up. Well, the, the biggest problem I find on the left and, and the progressive left is the siloization of the left and almost like um, a superstar mentality. I, I, I wish John Conyers was alive because he, he would have never stood for that. And Mimi Kennedy knows what I'm talking about. Yeah, Joel, right. I was going to, and Andrea, I want to shout out Andrea, who's been, who's been in this for so long, too, with me. Um, wait a minute. LeBron James is the obvious press release guy at the That's microphone, right. and he wants to do this. Why can't any of, none of us know how to get to him or who he's doing it with? And the, we're the grassroots. Why not? He's the one for the press conference, Joel. You get to him. I'm sure all of us with their information will be happy to be in the backup band. But but where's where's that guy who says he wants to step up? Yeah, I think, in fact, I'm so glad you mentioned that, Mimi, because there's some African-American lawyers in Charlotte who I went to law school with at UNC Chapel Hill Law School who for a living represent NBA basketball players. I used to work with a guy named Kendall Gill. I ran the Kendall Gill homeless shelter. So I'm going to be bringing them together for a conversation. We can't meet at a restaurant and drink wine. I don't know how we're going to do this, but um, Michael a Jordan lives bench. here too. Meet at a park uh, bench uh, a or park in a parking garage like Dick Deep Throat. Listen, we are done. It's, a, it's an hour and a half. Again, this will be rebroadcast on Monday. Our regular meetings will start again in two week, a, a week from this coming Monday. Please, uh, Paul, we'll get this out. Uh, it's been recorded, especially the first hour is meant to be a primer. We've got all the basic issues here. Uh, uh, registration, vote by mail, uh, count the ballots, uh, get people out, protect the polls. It's been fantastic. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Paul. And we will see you um, uh, uh, on the internet. And uh, God help us all in November, because we'll need it. Thank you, everyone. We're going to sign off. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Great call. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Bob. Thank Me you. Me. Thanks, everybody. OK, you guys. No more stolen elections.